Hi, hello, Pastor. Greetings, young lady. How you doing today? Very good. How about you? Bless you. I am well. I am well. Thank you. It's good to be here with you at this table. It's good to have you. Happy Father's Day. Thank mm. you. Thank yep. you so much. Mm. I appreciate that. Happy Children's Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we wanted to ask you a few questions. Sure. But the first questions are... A little bit like family related since it is Father's Day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the first questions was, what is the funniest thing that Donovan has ever said or done? Oh my goodness. Because like you yeah. always talking about how he says like um, funny things in like the service. Yes. <laughs> well, he, he does so much. I, I you know, to in this moment kind of cap, kind of bring it all down to one particular moment. Let me see. Recently, I don't know if this was funny, but it was just kind of like, you know, okay. Um, he, we were doing some work at the house, right? So we had just painted the deck, mm -hmm. right? A lot of hard work. The forecast said sun all weekend, loving it. Then the clouds started to roll in. Now a storm is kind of oh, brewing. No. So we checked the radar. There's rain coming. So Joan of it's drawing, and I walk into the house, and I say to, to Sister Singh, I say, we got to pray. We have got to pray right now, because I had just finished working all day long. Mm. And she said, okay, we'll pray. And I heard Joan of him begin to pray. You know, he's praying in the background. Ba -ba 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 -ba. He's speaking <laughs> in tongues. He's praying. He said, all right, Dad, it's done. The rain is not coming. <laughs> and I said, okay. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, and then I turn to my wife and say, all right, hon, we got to pray. And Joan of it said, Dad. Just have some faith, man. <laughs> so we had some faith, and it did not rain. So thank God for yeah. his prayers that were answered. Yeah. Yep. But that's the beauty of prayer, too. Yeah. You know, we all have that place with God. If we'll, if we'll just use it, you know, the, mm -hmm. the prayer, uh, the faith of a child, you know, just trusting that, that the Lord is hearing us when we call. And that's, mm -hmm. one, you know, one thing scripturally, too, is Jesus did this, and I, I was, was intrigued by this. When he prayed, he was praying out loud in front of a group of people. And then he looks up, as I imagine, he looks up and he says, Father, thank you for hearing me. And I, I did that not for my sake, but for their sake. Mm -hmm. And so it's this powerful approach, our powerful perspective, that whenever you approach God to know that he's hearing you, Amen. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Like God always comes for your words. There's never a time he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He may not always give you what you ask for, but he'll always come for your words. Amen. So have some faith, man. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, another question. How did you meet your wife? Yes. Yep. Well, uh, <coughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, we come from the same neighborhood. Um, and I, I was kind of familiar with my wife's family a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so we just kind of brushed shoulders throughout the years with different people and different crowds. One day, you know, our eyes just caught <laughs> and we got interested in each other and started talking. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was history. I mean, truly, <clears throat> it's hard to give you all the... Uh, all the dynamics because this is before Jesus, mm. right? So this is this is under the blood, you know. <laughs> charges cannot be held against us any further. <clears throat> but once we realized that we were attracted to each other and we started to talk, God just sw swoop, swoop in, mm. swoop, swept, swooped in. What is the word for that? Swooped swept. In, swept in, moved in. He yeah. moved in like a flood, <laughs> took us off of our feet. We, we were brought into the church. So I'll give you the timeline. Uh, how about that? So we started to talk like at the end of July, kind of caught each other's interest, mm -hmm. decided we we're going to start talking. Now we're two kids from the world, two kids without much structure or protection, two kids that weren't, didn't know how to do things right. Mm -hmm. We would have messed each other up. We, we really would have. Probably me more her. Uh, but end of July, probably in the beginning of September, we started going to church together. And, and she wasn't very religious, I wasn't very religious, but God just moved in so powerfully. And he rescued us from each other and ourselves and then set us up to succeed. Mm. Very beautiful. And we were baptized together in February of 98. So we met July of 97. We were baptized in February of 98. She was baptized seven days after me. Wow. So 
it's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, we, we've been awesome ever mm-hmm. since. It keeps getting better and better. You know, I call her affectionately my white girl. <laughs> She's my white girl. She's solid. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. 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 What is... Mm. What is one of the most memorable moments you have had with your entire family? Wow, that's a great question. There have been so many of those moments. Let me think. Most memorable moment. Who? Huh. Jesus. That's a, that's a good question. Now, there's been plenty. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to scan through the years. Because there's, there's moments that are memorable to you, and there's moments that are memorable to them. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm trying to find a moment we were all smiling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you may have to get back to me on that one. All right, uh, all, right, uh, all right. One second. Um, you know, I, I will say this. There was this, there was this one time where we were, you know, when, when you're going through life, you ever walk through a moment, and you just, you feel, like it feels surreal. It feels like this will be a moment that we'll always remember. Mm -hmm. It it feels like a a moment captured in time. It's like a picture taken, put it, put into a book. And that one day you'll remember this day and you'll remember this time. And, and for me, this was before Jonathan actually, it was Jolina, Josiah and Josefina, you know, and Josie was about a year old. Jolina, I don't know what that would make her, maybe five, Mm -hmm. Josiah, maybe four. I think math is failing me right now, (laughs) but the kids were kind of, playing in the grass and and the setting was simplistic I mean it was nothing great we were getting our car fixed Mm. amazing (laughs) right we're off the 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 busy uh, street cars are zipping by but we found this little nook because the kids were getting anxious Mm. in the um, in the you know the the auto shops we took them out to this little grass knoll this little nook and we got them all donuts (laughs) <laughs> and we just sat there because the Dunkin' Donuts was right there, which was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I had my coffee. The kids had their donuts. And I remember me as a dad. Now, this is just me as a dad. I can't say this is their moment. But I just remember them playing. One second. The sun is shining. You know, you got these kids running around. <clears throat> And um, our daughter was sick at that time. Mm-hmm. Josephina was sick, and we knew she was sick. We knew how bad it was. The kids didn't know how bad it was. But it was in that moment where you, you just see them having fun, and you just escape the, the pressures of life, mm-hmm. you know, and just enjoy it. Like, this is family. Kids are loving it. Everybody's happy. And just seeing them there in that moment, it just it seared into my soul. Mm. So I've treasured treasure that moment. Sorry yeah. about that. It's very, it's Sorry. Very, yeah. Amen. Mm. I wouldn't say that's the most memorable, yeah, though. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's the moment that comes to my mind. It's yeah. just reality, so. Amen. Mm. But they were loving it. And, you know, I, I would say the, ener- the energizing factor for them was the donuts. <laughs> you know, the donuts were, yeah. they were pure sugar. <laughs> You know, Donuts will make any kid happy. Sister, <laughs> they will. And it makes yep. every parent happy just for as long as it takes the kid to eat the donut. Because <laughs> after the donut's gone, it's chaos. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. But running, playing, the grass was, you know, moving in the wind. The sun was coming down just right. The kids were smiling, laughing. It's beautiful. Mm. Amen. Amen. Mm. What is your favorite candy? Well, I think we all know this. <laughs> candy or chocolate? It can be anything. It okay, doesn't really have to let's be Let's just anything. say sweets. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Kit Kats. Kit Kats. Hands down. Love some Kit Kats. Recently, I've been kind of growing up a little bit, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we can call it that. <laughs> I'm enjoying Twix a whole lot. I think I'm venturing further out even to like Snickers. So... Finding different stuff to yes, try. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But I will never turn down any Kit Kats, so please keep them coming. And the church has blessed me tremendously <laughs> with Kit Kats. How did that come to happen? Like, what made Kit Kats be your favorite? Yeah. I think that's a great question. I think it was, <clears throat> well, to me, they're, they're low calorie. 
right? So mm -hmm. I think for, you know, a pack of Kit Kats, it's like 220 calories, I think it is. And so I thought, you know what, I love after fasting, I love to have something sweet. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I break a fast, I like to have something sweet. Mm -hmm. Typically, I'll stop fasting late at night. And so trying to find something that I felt would be a good sweet, not overbearing, I started trying Kit Kats. And I have the Kit Kats with the coffee. And it just clicked. It, just, it was just like Sister Sing and me. We just clicked. <laughs> you know, Kit Kat caught my eye. I caught its eye. <laughs> and we've never been the same. And then Sister Katie, bless her, Sister Katie Swab, she found out I enjoyed Kit Kats, and she found out it was a way that I liked to kind of decompress, mm. like to enjoy a king-size Kit Kat. <laughs> she started bringing them to me, mm. you know, every week. So she, she was my supplier. <laughs> okay. She made sure I, I never lacked. And then the church just took that mantle. And one time, one time, I had a Kit Kat tree that was comprised of 77 uh, mini Kit Kats. I think wow. I remember that. Remember that? I think I do. <laughs> and I didn't share a single Kit Kat <laughs> with a single person. I went home with that thing, and I didn't sit down and eat it all at once, because that would not be responsible. <laughs> but every day, two or three. Every day, five or six, 10 or eight, <laughs> 12 or 20. Mm -hmm. Until it was gone. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> mm. I know my dad still owes you a Kit Kat. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to talk about his debts. You know? He needs to stop eating them. But uh, I can respect the pull and the, the, you know, the difficulty of watching a Kit Kat, you know, and just seeing mm -hmm. it sit there. So I understand the struggle. Mm -hmm. But someday, yeah. one will make it to me, I'm certain. Mm -hmm. You'll get that Kit Kat. <laughs> Even if it's in the rapture, <laughs> he's like, wait, and he throws the cake <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> and I'll eat it on the way up. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, um, if you have the time, yes. we'd like to move into another portion of sure. an interview. Just sure. asking more, like, not really serious, but more about your ministry and how you like how you're a pastor sure. and just how stuff it started like, that. like yeah. yeah yes yeah well i'll try to give you the condensed version of that all you know when i came into the faith i felt even outside of the world mm -hmm. uh, excuse me outside in the world outside the church in in the mass of of peoples i felt like there was something god was calling me to do i wasn't mm -hmm. a, re a very religious person I wasn't trained in, in religious thinking, but still I felt like there, there was something more. Now, when I was on the streets, I, I worked with people in a certain way. Just a few seconds, okay. I'm just, I just, this, is, this is your testimony, so I just want to bring the microphone sure. a little closer. Should I get closer? Or? Maybe just a little bit. Maybe, okay. maybe two inches closer. There you go. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So I worked with people in a certain way. Now, I wouldn't say that that work was productive that work was not productive. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the right way to handle people, but there was still a sense of working with people, a still a sense of connecting with where people were at. Um, unfortunately though, with who I was and where I was, that was not healthy, nor was it used for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And so there always was this, this calling inside of me that I did not know how to connect with um, or even verbalize, I should say. Connecting with, I did, but in a negative way. So fast forward, coming into the church, you know, uh, the first few experiences in church, there was a real draw in me to the ministry. I felt like God put this, this, this desire in me uh, to do something for God. Now I will say this for you young ladies, there is <clears throat> no error in imagining or dreaming big things to do for God. I, I want to invite you to do that. I, I want to encourage you to dream big, to dream crazy when it comes to the things of God. I mean, mm. envision yourself doing things for God. Envision great things beyond your ability, capability, beyond even the, the, um, the, the realm of possibility for where you're at right now. You have to do that. And when God puts that in your spirit, don't blame yourself for it. Understand that 
if there's a desire in you to teach, if there's a desire in you to preach, if there's a desire in you to, to go to missions and to, to witness and to bring people into the faith, that, chances are that's not you. you. You didn't author that. It's God. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say dream, you take that and you begin to dream with it. You take what God puts in your spirit and you begin to dream with it. And that's what I did. You know, I felt something bear witness in me. Uh, I was inspired by great men of God and women of God around me, and I wanted to do what they were doing. And so my heroes shifted. My heroes went from the street thugs and the, the, the you know, the chaos mm -hmm. and mayhem of the world, and those, those people you, you aspire to be like or want to have that kind of influence or whatever it is, it shifted to a whole different type of person, the whole, a whole different quality of person. And I began to have godly heroes. Mm -hmm. When I opened the Bible and flipped through the pages, I began to have godly heroes, which, by the way, John is one of my godly heroes. I don't know if you guys know John, the <laughs> Apostle John. Love him. Love him. He's fantastic. You know, Elijah was a godly hero of mine. And so you, you go through these scriptures. You, you walk through the, the, the Christian journey. You rub shoulders with people. I've had great leaders in my life uh, that were very... Um, genuine and sincere with tremendous spiritual integrity and I wanted to be that I wanted to be that because that's what helped me and I wanted to be that for somebody else mm. and God began to deal with me I remember the first time um, <clears throat> I was gonna be allowed to preach Now I did a lot of preaching in the streets I don't mean gospel I mean talking trash <laughs> you know, yelling and yapping and screaming and, and declaring and you know all the garbage, all the nonsense. Now, mm -hmm. you're too sweet for that. Your faces <laughs> declare that truth. You know, you, you're, you're innocent. But I did a lot of dumb preaching. Mm -hmm. But when I came into church, I had a, a desire to preach. I, I saw what it was doing for people. I, I felt what it was doing for me. And I said, I, I want to be that. I want to mm -hmm. be that for somebody else. Amen? Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time, it was actually uh, the first time God gave me a word. It was right before I got married. I was sitting by myself. And uh, this is how I spent the night before my wedding, by myself, in prayer. Had my Bible open because I, I just had a hunger for the Word. You know, I wasn't trying to, like, read it to um, argue with it. I wasn't trying to read it to disprove it. I was reading it because I was in awe of it. I was mm -hmm. in love with it. I wanted more of it. Mm -hmm. It was a treasure. I was opening a treasure. And everything else just went away. I didn't need a movie. I didn't need music. I didn't need a club or friends or dancing or nonsense. I just needed the word. I'd opened the word. And I tell you, Sister Natalie and Sister Zuri, when I opened the word that night, it was like God just dropped a thought bigger than my ability into my brain. It was more than I can articulate. It was, it was more educated than I was to handle. But the word just fell into my spirit. And I captured it and wrote it down. I said, this, that, the other thing. Ha! This, that, the other <laughs> thing. Ha! And I preached it. I preached it in that moment. I wrote it down. I folded it up and I put it away. And two services after that, my pastor walked up to me. And I was in deep prayer. God's always going to call you from something to something, not from nothing to something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just want to sit there and think God's going to... No, no, no. He'll pass you by. Yeah. you got to be engaged in something. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And he calls you from something to something. And so I was, I was in deep prayer. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, D did the Lord give you a word? Wow. I said, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh yes, <laughs> he did. He said, I want you to open up service next week. Wow. First time. I'd never spoke in church. I wouldn't even speak in school. I'd speak on the streets, but stand up for, I'd rather you flunk me instead of stand up and read something. I, I don't advise that, but I'd say, no way, teacher, no, no way, no how. I'm not getting up in front of these kids and reading this. <clears throat> but I got up, and I declared what thus saith the Lord, what God spoke to me. Mm. And it, I knew in that moment when I spoke that it was bigger than me. This was not just some act. It wasn't just some some skill, some art form, something learned. It was something from the Holy of Holies. And I never felt more myself than in that moment. 
And it was, you know, if I may say, I thought it was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a great word. After the service that day, I think we had like five people baptized. And wow, <clears> praise <throat> God. And some of those people were family. They were extended family. And so it was pretty, pretty amazing. It still stays with me to this day. And I still have that first word that I preached. And, and it's in Romans where the apostle talks about we glory also in tribulation. And it was just powerful. Yeah. But from there, and am I taking too much of your time? No. Okay, well, You're it's good. Father's Day. <laughs> so <clears throat> from that moment, the, the call to preach was starting to, to open up. Now, within the call to preach, you can be called to preach and not be a pastor. That's mm -hmm. a different calling. Just because you can preach doesn't mean you should pastor. Mm -hmm. Because there are pastors that can't preach. They don't have the, the gifting to preach. Now, they may be gifted to teach, but they, 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 just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you're a preacher. Just because you're a preacher doesn't mean you're a pastor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so God started cultivating the call to pastor in me. And I started to feel it. Now, it started to manifest in different ways. You know, I was working with people. I was doing the prison ministry. I was, I was compassionate for people. I, I cared about people. I, I helped people carry a burden. You know, I was meeting them where they were at, and I was ministering to them, and I was faithful to it. You know, every week, you know, I was there every week, and I'm speaking about the prison ministry because that's where I see the, the formative uh, years of what would become a pastoral ministry for me. Mm -hmm. Now, when I went in there, I would preach evangelistically. I would have an evangelistic anointing, but there was still elements that were pastoral because I was caring for them. I was connecting with their families. Mm -hmm. I was I was ministering to their lives. And I remember too, this was I thought this was interesting. Because as the years were progressing in ministry, preaching, teaching Sunday school, all of the above, and the pastoral uh, office was opening up. Before I stepped into it, um, I was working with our bishop, my pastor, Pastor Gonzalez. And he was letting me know that this is what we, we felt from the Lord. God has sent an angel to that city. There was an mm. angel in Bolingbrook. We are to build a church there. God is calling mm. you and your wife to start a church there. Now, we don't know what that means. We don't know what that's supposed to look like. Mm. We want to obey the man of God, but also we want to obey the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the pressure of an organization or expectation. It was the, it was the, the timing and the calling of the spirit of God. But I remember, this is interesting, I'm in the prison services and I'm preaching and I'm ministering and there was a young man in there who was, he had a serious case pressed against him. So he was fasting for 40 days, no food, just water. And so needless to say, you fast like that, you're going to start tapping into some sens sensitivities, mm -hmm. opening up to the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And I, ha I have not told anyone in that setting what God was doing with me you know, that I was getting ready for the pastoral ministry. He comes up to me after the service with tears in his eyes. And he said, you know, brother, I was praying for you today, you know, while we were worshiping. And I saw, I saw God put on you a pastoral anointing. Mm. He said, God just put a pastoral anointing on you. I, 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 I don't know if I'm in a place to say this to you, but I feel like God is calling you to pastor somewhere. And it's about to happen. Wow. Wow. And little did he know <laughs> that we were weeks away from stepping into our pastoral ministry, wow. which wow. is a journey, I mm -hmm. might ask. Amen. Amen. You don't just arrive. <laughs> <laughs> you got to grow. And, and as God builds the church, he builds the man. Yeah. He builds the woman. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> sometimes we don't feel, how do you say, um, capable we don't feel like we have the ability to meet the need of the ministry but god always has it mm -hmm. we have to be available and obedient mm -hmm. and god will supply mm -hmm. and teach you along the way mm -hmm. amen does that suffice is this good is this yeah. okay yeah. Is this good. Good material? Great. Great. Yeah, let me check my notes <laughs> okay. sorry you got any questions mm -hmm. how was Mm, let's see. How was your first experience with the um, like teaching kids? Oh goodness! Yes, yes. You want to do that to me, huh? <laughs> Just kidding. I'll give you a story. Okay, I loved it. Now, <clears throat> I realized right away that I couldn't 
teach kids like I saw somebody else teach them. Okay, so again, no formal training, right? Mm. I'm in the church. I think I'm in the church at this point, maybe eight months. Mm. But I'm on fire for God. Mm. I'm fasting every week. You know, I fasted every week for until this day. Okay, I was praying several hours a day, three to four hours a day, constantly in my Bible, constantly listening to preaching. I mean, I was ready to teach. You know, it was like a fire showed up in my bones. But when I went into the class, I tried to teach like I saw these other teachers teaching, and it didn't work for me because it wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't who I am, I should say that, like that. So I started to just teach them the way you see me teach here. It's the same, right? So when I taught the kids, I taught the same way you see me preach. You know, I was screaming at kids. And I don't think they were very receptive to that, okay? <laughs> I don't think they enjoyed it. But I had to just do who, what I had to do and who I was. Mm. But we had fun. We had fun. <laughs> I knew I had to have fun with the kids. We had a great time. But I will say uh, there was one time in particular uh, in the very beginning of my uh, children's ministry experience. Okay, this one stands out. Shining bright experience. Did not discourage me. And why I say that, you'll soon find out. So I think I'm preaching a great message. I'm preaching a house of fire to these kids, you know. Mm -hmm. Or I forget which verse we're in, but I'm teaching them and preaching to them, screaming at them. We're having a blast. <laughs> Fourth, fifth, sixth graders. They can handle it. They can handle it. Service concludes, you know. We're getting ready to give snack outside because the weather's nice. Mm -hmm. So our, our thing is we're going to bless these kids. We're going to give them some popsicles outside. Mm -hmm. You know, this is going to be wonderful. They're going to love it. So as we're dismissing the class, transitioning to the outside, a young girl walks up to me, little girl fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, one of those, taps me on the sh uh, arm, and she's like, mister? I said, yes. She said, your class is boring, <laughs> and you're ugly. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh. I said, well, no ice cream for you. Oh, no. Have a nice day. <laughs> wow. But, uh, you know, interestingly enough, you know, kids, kids will tell you, the truth you yeah. know, they, they, they don't hold any punches <laughs> yeah. and so i was doing uh the same time i was doing children's ministry i was also in the prisons mm. preaching in the prisons i was more intimidated teaching sunday school than i was going into the prisons <laughs> i kid you not no. kids were tough but i loved it i loved it i loved pouring into these these children they are the future mm -hmm. you are the future your mm -hmm. generation is the future yeah. You are worth okay. every ounce of effort mm -hmm. that we could ever give to you to mm. position you to live for God the way you're supposed to live for Him. You are the torch carriers. Amen. Amen. It's your generation. Mm -hmm. It's your generation. Mm. I believe that. Well, do you have any <laughs> questions? Um, I want to ask, what is your most favorite thing about being a pastor at this church? Yeah. The people. You know, the people, I have never once felt, like, <clears throat> overwhelmed, I guess. I'm, I'm trying to articulate this. I've never felt like this was too much. Mm -hmm. I never felt like pastoring was too hard because God has graced us with tremendous people. I don't know about everybody else's experience and the things they go through, and are there situations where people take, 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 and, and, and leave people empty, empty, empty? Yes, 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 there is. But I have never felt that. Mm -hmm. So the people that God has surrounded us with has been a tremendous joy in our lives. It, there's a sense of honor and humility, you know, to serve such a group of people. And so we are in love with the people of God and the work of God. It just makes it that much more enjoyable to work alongside people that have the vision, they have the fire, and they have the anointing. And we don't have a, we don't have a dull church. We don't have dull people. Mm -hmm. You know, what I love about our church too, Sister Natalie, is that we have a lot of people that were born in the trenches. You know, they know what it's like to have suffered through the fire. They... They, they had to be pulled out of darkness. And there's something about those type of people that have the residue of what they came out of, yet have the substance of where they're headed. Mm. 
Mm. And it balances them out. And they have an appreciation for forgiveness and mercy and grace and for the things of God. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our church has that. Like this, this place just feels healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to, and if I can name drop, uh, I'm going to name drop. I was talking to Brother Lee Stone King recently. Mm -hmm. And he said, boy, if I lived in your area, I would be at your church. <laughs> that means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I know what he's saying. He's saying that, he's saying what I know to be true. We have a very healthy place to be. Mm -hmm. It's healthy. And I don't say that lightly. It's because of the ministry that's here. It's the accountability that's here. It's mm -hmm. the families that this place is comprised of. It's people like yourselves, young people like yourselves. Because at every level, people are experiencing ministry. So you can't just be high level here and low level here. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't just be low, low, high. You, you've got to be high, 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 high. You've got to have high level of integrity and ministry all the way throughout. And, and the only way to do that is not school. It's not knowledge. It's not degrees. It's not reputation. I know there's such a striving in certain movements to be known and to be, to be sought after and to have a name. Nonsense. The greatest thing to have is a love for Jesus mm -hmm. and to make mm -hmm. him real in every area of your life because the people see the reality of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we have that. We have, if he's real, if we have real worshipers in the nursery and real worshipers in TBC, that's the believers crew for those of you that don't know that. If we have real believers and worshipers in every stage, every facet of ministry here, then we give, and it, we give a level of ministry to be met by every person. Mm -hmm. To say, you know what, I went to that church and Natalie and Zuri, they're the real thing, man. The real thing, and people may never say that to you. And I want to encourage you with this: always be who God called you to be. Yeah. Never give in to the pressure of what people want you to be. Mm -hmm. Stand in your relationship with God and protect that relationship, because they may they may despise you for it, mm -hmm. but they will yeah. always respect you in the end. Mm -hmm. And you you would rather be despised by men, so that you can honor God than to be honored by men and be a contradiction to God. Mm. You don't want that. I, I messed all that up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Be yeah. right with God. <laughs> yeah. Okay, even if it makes you wrong with people. Mm. Stay right with God and you'll attract the right people. Amen. Amen. Because they'll come and say, man, Zuri, who I tried to, I try to make her, you know, I try to trip her up. I try to mess her up. Because people, miserable people want to make people miserable. Mm -hmm. They want to pull you down to their level. Don't go down to their level. Yeah. Hold your standard. Hold your level. If they don't want to climb up, then you don't have to continue with that relationship. You just keep living for God. Amen. Amen. And then it will attract people and say, this Jesus is real because mm -hmm. he's real. Yeah. So be on fire. I bless you with, <laughs> with the fire. The flames of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Fan Amen. the flame. The anointing of God in Jesus' Amen. name. Um, one last question, and this is to end, you know. Sure, sure. You want to kick me out? That's <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just, I want to ask, do you have any advice for all the fathers? Yes. Um, be what you want to see. You know, a father that wants to see a kid on fire for God cannot not be on fire. Mm -hmm. If you want your kids, if you want your daughters to be good ladies, if you want your sons to be good men, then you've got to stand in your place. You've got to guard the gate. The dad is the priest of the home. The dad is really the priest of the home. He, now a mom by God's grace, a spiritual mom, can pray a hedge around her house. Absolutely. There are covenants in place where a woman will uh, abide by and she brings an absolute amount of protection around her home. There's nothing to take away from the ladies, but a dad really guards the door. Yeah. And not only does he guard the door, but he stabilizes identity. You know, fathers, when they are in our lives, help us realize who we are. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to speak to that, affirm that. It's a very powerful thing. You know, speaking of a father affirming, I, I just thought of Peter. You know what I love about Peter? is that the dude always wanted to say something about something, <laughs> right? He wanted to have an answer, right? Yeah. Mm. You know, tabernacle for thee and Moses, and, you know, we'll make one for you. You're on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is just like, just be quiet. <laughs> you, you always got to say something, you know. <laughs> you know, 
But what, what was amazing to me is that when Peter failed the Lord, now we have to understand something very powerful about that transaction is that Peter saw Jesus in, in that place, in that court, in that, in that time of persecution, in that, in that time of, of complaint and judgment. He saw Jesus, their eyes caught. When Peter denied him, Jesus turns and they catch eyes, they see eye to eye. And Peter then just begins to, to run and, and to weep and he is miserable now, right? He, in his mind, he failed God, the worst you could ever fail him. You know, in a time of need, this was his friend. In a time of persecution, in a time of his greatest need, he failed him. He, he abandoned him. And there was nothing he could do about it. There was nothing he could do about it. But when Jesus catches them on the shore, you know, in John 21, Peter and Jesus, they, they catch up. Because God will always catch up with you. God will always meet you at a place of reconciling. Mm -hmm. reconciling you and helping mm -hmm. rebuild your faith mm -hmm. and he he meets Peter here Peter as you know I don't want to take up too much time but Peter's on the boat he, he recognizes that's Jesus he doesn't not by <clears throat> not by visual appearance but by behavior by by thought by character he, he recognizes that's Jesus he jumps into the water he begins to swim to the shore when he gets there Jesus has this whole thing set up for just him and Peter he's restoring Peter he says if you love me of course I love you. Feed my sheep. He does it three times. We know Peter betrayed Jesus three times, right? Mm -hmm. so the beautiful thing about that is that this is, in a way, in a sense, applicable to a father affirming. I'm not talking to you, Peter, about your failure. I'm talking to you about your future. Mm -hmm. And a good father knows how to discipline and inspire. Mm -hmm. They know how to say, you know what, son, daughter, that was wrong but that doesn't mean you're wrong. There's more for you. Mm -hmm. I expect more from you. And speak to the greatness that's inside of their children. But don't just speak to it, be it. Be that greatness, be that example. Give them something to aspire towards. And godly men and godly fathers are in need in this hour. They are in need in this hour. Mm -hmm. A dad that knows how to pray, a dad that knows how to worship, a dad that knows how to prefer the things of God, to respect ministry and to encourage the best. There are too many men that want to be boys and they're letting their wives lead the family. Mm -hmm. And that, that's out of order. Men have got to step into their place. They don't push mom around. They don't push their wives around. They have to work with mom. Dad, husbands and wives got to work together to lead their children the best way they know how. Mm -hmm. Together, a godly mother and a godly father is the greatest thing for a home and a family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are too many dads on the sofa, too many dads in front of the TV, too many dads not pushing for spiritual things, leaving spirituality to the moms. Because a mom is going to be, you know, it's within a woman to be nurturing. It's within a woman to be sensitive and to be open. And this is why you'll see in our culture there's so many more women at an altar. There's so many more women bringing their families to church why dad is on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Dad's at home, dad's doing something else. Dad, you know, the family's at the altar, dad's at the back of the church. Don't come into the church and look for the safe seat. Come into church and get up front. Mm -hmm. Get exposed to the fire, amen? Get exposed mm -hmm. to the heat. Does that make sense? Yeah. And a dad that leads that way, a dad that operates that way, he's setting his children up for success. He's saving his home, he's saving his marriage. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous covering when when dad is in his place. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank, you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Well, we enjoyed talking with you, Pastor. Okay. Yeah. Well, you have to say that. You have to <laughs> say that. <laughs> yeah, that's all we have. Yeah. All the questions, but we we had a good time yeah. talking. Amen. Yeah. It was good yeah. I Amen. It. thank you well listen you're welcome it's a blessing to, to speak with you both i i want to say in this recording that shall be captured and brought into the air <laughs> somewhere <clears throat> that i am personally proud of you you two ladies i am proud of you and uh, you encourage me because i love nothing more than to see 
this generation here, right here, these, these precious young souls on fire for God. Mm -hmm. And I speak to you as a pastor, be everything you can be in God and make no apologies for it and go after it. Yeah. Go after it. Even if you have to go alone, go after it. When you're at the altar, don't, don't wait for the crowd to go with you. Go after it. Respond to God. Always respond to God. Always make it your habit in life to respect the things of God. Open your ear to the voice of God and your life to the direction of God. Mm -hmm. And you will always, always end up on top. You will never be disappointed when you follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's where it's at. If men are frustrated with religion, then they've got to stop being religious. But relationship is dangerous mm -hmm. because relationship is unpredictable. I have a relationship with this girl. She's called my wife. <laughs> I don't know where she's at right now. <laughs> I don't have it controlled. I don't know if she's going to be at reservations right now or no reservations. I don't know if she's cooking or going out to eat. But see, relationship is dangerous, but it's exciting. It's alive. It requires. Religion says, do ABC, you're good with me. Mm. Relationship says, give and take. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little longer. Fast a little longer. Go ahead and just tarry here a little longer. Oh, your friends are going out for pizza. Guess what? You're fasting. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> You know, oh, everyone's leaving the church because there's a you know balloon fight in the grass. But guess what? Relationship says, I want you at this altar just a little while longer. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to do it? And God will always give you invitations for further. You have to take them. If you don't take them, then you condition yourself to say no to him. Mm -hmm. And you shut him off. And when you shut him off, you are more susceptible to weariness. Mm -hmm. Because the spirit of this age is, is oppressive. It's, it's wearing the saints down. It's wearing down the mind. It's wearing down the emotions. It's wearing down the homes. And the only way to be restored, the only way to be energized, is to be in the flow of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can no longer survive off of traditional things. We, we need to, to be spiritual. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, the son is more than a servant because the son can be trusted. It didn't say child, it said son. Why? It's a position of possession. So when you're led, you can lead. When you're led, you can tap into. When you're led, you can utilize. When you're mm -hmm. led, you can become an asset for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Not just a baby. Ma, 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 ma. You know? <laughs> ba, 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 ba. <laughs> but a son is functional. A son mm -hmm. is... Man, I, that's my son out there. He's, he's the, on the front lines. That means he's active. Mm -hmm. And the son, don't, don't get offended, ladies. It's not an exclusion <laughs> of daughters, you know. The son is it's all, it's, it's humanity. Amen. Mm -hmm. I hope I said something good. That was good. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, good. It was great. It's These great. words are leaving me, you know. <laughs> it's after church. No, they're good. Words are leaving me. Mm -hmm. They're good. They're, they're thinking about how, what title.